Well, we come now to the final um, moment in our conference. And we have had among us, as John Henry announced, a living connection with von Hildebrand through the presence of some of his relatives. But we also have with us a living connection with him through his beloved wife, Alice von Hildebrand. Uh, if you've looked into the book on love, uh, the nature of love, you see that the book is dedicated to my beloved wife, Lily. Alice von Hildebrand has been a widow for 33 years, and in all these years has devoted all of her energy and resources to sharing her husband's legacy and spreading it. And in fact, she has shown a talent, a special talent, for reaching people who are not trained in philosophy or theology. She knows how to reach a broad audience of interested people and to make von Hildebrand's thought fruitful uh, for them. And I must add that uh, she has been a very great and faithful supporter of the Legacy Project from the beginning. Without that support of Alice von Hildebrand, there would be no Legacy Project. We would not all be gathered here today. So it's a great pleasure to introduce a dear friend, a friend of 44 years. I met Alice von Hildebrand on the same day that I met Dietrich von Hildebrand 44 years ago, and so I introduce here a dear friend, a great woman of faith, and the widow and wife of Dietrich von Hildebrand. So I ask you now to give us your presentation. <laughs> Reverend fathers and dear friends, I ask my dear friend John to make his introduction short. He has done as well as possible, but I could do better. <laughs> I could do better because I learned some practical wisdom or worldly wisdom of which my husband knew nothing. <laughs> but because I had to survive at the City University of New York, I found out that to boast a little bit and claim that you're a scholar impresses people. And so if I just wanted to introduce myself, I was a very simple introduction. There's a man of the name of John of Salisbury. And he said something that is reported by another scholar, Bernard of Chartres. We are dwarves sitting on the shoulder of giants. That's what I've been doing since I was 19 years old. In other words, the whole work that I've done, my teaching, my conference that I've given, the articles I've given, are all based on what my husband taught me. Now, looking at his work, it seems to me that one of the very striking characteristics is that he's unified. Let me try to explain. When I was 19, I started reading Plato. Then I make no secret of the fact that I was overwhelmed by the greatness of his thought. For example, he tells us that one of the purposes of education is to unify the child in the good. And he adds that we are split personalities and we need to be unified. We need to be unified in the truth. And this, it seems to me that as far as I can judge, what is so remarkable about the thought of my husband is that there is unity, whether he turned to his metaphysics, his epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, social philosophy, political philosophy, there is a line of continuity, which is not to be found in very many philosophers. Well, let me begin at the beginning. The first part of my husband's life that I would like to share with you is based on his memoirs. I'm very close to eternal youth, and you sort of re-examining your life, and there are lots of things that you deplore, that you regret, that you haven't done, 
but this one thing that I'm very proud of. Because of the difference of age between us, I regretted the fact that there was a whole chunk of his land that I haven't shared with him. And I told him one day, it's very sad indeed that I came so late into your life. And he immediately had the solution. He said, I'll write it for you. And the next day, he started to write his memoirs. It is difficult for you to believe that he wrote a memoir of 5,000 pages. Unpublished, not even typed. But I have this very magnificent manuscript which is offered to me, which is simultaneously a sort of confession because he's reviewing his whole life and, uh, of course, notices that he's made mistakes, certain things that he regrets. It's a sort of confession, but simultaneously he gives us the most detailed story of a life that a husband has ever given to his wife. And though there's absolutely nothing that he doesn't share with me. Now, this is why I have a treasure, which is absolutely unique. Nobody has read it, so I fail. And let me share with you some of the things that he says about his youth. He begins his memoir by thanking his parents for having given him existence. He was a fruit of a great love. He lived in ideal circumstances, you know, to be born in Florence. It's not bad. <laughs> To be raised by parents who loved him, preceded by five sisters, extraordinary women, I have the privilege of knowing four of them, in an incredibly beautiful house, a monastery of the Franciscan of the 16th century that was secularized by Napoleon and bought for his father, by his father late in the 19th century with a magnificent campo commanding the view of Florence, which is absolutely unique. He was the youngest of a family of six, preceded by five sisters. And one of the first blessings of his life was that already as a child, he discovered through his mother and his lovely five sisters the beauty of femininity. This is a grace that he appreciated to the very end of his life. His first picture of a woman was something noble, and generous, sweet, gentle, and so on and so on. At the age of nine, he wrote a poem, singing the praise of women and telling us how superior they were to men. They had more charm, they had more grace, their voice was sweeter, their whole appearance was more pleasant, and so on. But very typically, he was nine years old, and typically ends in seeing this only one point in which men and then he used a, a wrong German expression. He said, more right than women, because they love women, and women love men. So, <laughs> well, therefore, let us keep this in mind, because for the rest of his life, he could never stand men who spoke irrespectfully about women. This was going to be one of the crises of his life, and this is going to explain that he understood already as a young man that the relation between man and woman is not a plaything. You know, if a woman truly has this beauty and dignity, she must be approached with love and respect. Let me share with you some of the things that he says in his memoirs. At the age of 14, he took a walk with his older sister and to my joy, I can say that his granddaughter and several of his great-grandchildren are there right in front of me. She was 13 years older. She was a very impressive lady. It was a grand dame, extremely elegant, extremely charming, very talented, a great pianist, and they took a walk. And she tried to convince him that truth was relative and all moral values changed from country to country. And to his amazement, my husband was 14, said, you're totally wrong. You're totally and radically mistaken. Obviously, being much older, she was offended, and she tried to find arguments, but the little boy pinned her down and refuted her. And they came home, <laughs> and there was a the father. And the father was an absolute relative. He said, just imagine, 
he does not want to see that moral values are relatives. And the father said, but what do you want? He's only 14. And then he said, Dad, if you have no better arguments against proposition that my age, your position is very weak indeed. <laughs> you know, don't forget, he was preceded by a father and mother were powerful personalities. Five sisters were powerful personalities. He had to assert himself and he managed to do so. For some mysterious reason, I call it grace, when he had no idea what grace was. Already as a young child, he was convinced of the divinity of Christ. Neither his father, nor his mother, nor any of his sisters considered Christ to be divine. One of his sisters, the young one, was told me that one day she was sharing her little boy's little fr fr uh, brother's uh, bedroom. And she said, you know, Mother said at table that Christ is quite a nice man, but there's nothing special. It's like all of us. And she told me, he jumped in his bed in his pyjama, straight his hand, and said, and I, I swear to you that Christ is God. He had forgotten it. But she told me the story, and she said, you know, I was baffled. I couldn't make anything out of it. Now, he was religiously minded, but he never went to church. He never prayed because one did not do that. The god of the Hildebrands was beauty. When he was six, suddenly his father and mother said, you know, he should be baptized. I mean, after all, it's a tradition in Europe that you get baptized. And his older sister started to joke about it, and he was very offended. He felt that it was something very serious, and he was baptized by a Protestant minister, but I mean, once again, did not practice his faith because the only thing that he knew, he had received a biblical story given for children and he knew about Abraham and Moses, but that was about all. From time to time, maybe he prayed, but I mean, very, very vague. Mm -hmm. Now, something extraordinary happened. His father was a famous sculptor, a very famous man, a great sculptor, who became knighted by the king of Bavaria because of the magnificent fountain that he created in Munich. And for him, as I said, beauty was his god. That was an absolute. And one very fine day, he comes to his, to his wife and five daughters. He said, you know, imagine something absolutely extraordinary happened to me. He was about 53 or 54. He said, for the first time in my life, I have a model who is a perfection of female beauty. He had seen hundreds of them. But for once, he saw one that was so absolutely, perfectly beautiful. And he claimed that it's more difficult to find a beautiful body than it is to find a beautiful face, which is difficult enough. At any rate, he said to them, come and look at her, come to my studio. And the little boy was 13. And he said, Dad, I don't want to go. And everybody was surprised. How can you just imagine absolute female beauty? He said, no, I want to reserve the day of seeing a woman naked on the great day of my marriage when I commit myself for life. I don't want to see a naked woman before that time. If that is not grace, I don't know what is. It's something absolutely amazing. He said, no. Now imagine today in the world in which we live, people are recommended to run naked because somehow they're supposed to overcome shame by running naked. I know very well what my husband would say. I don't think that it's a good idea at all because there is no reason to be ashamed of the human body created by God, but there's a reason to be ashamed of concupiscence. And actually what happened at the original sin was that Adam and Eve stripped themselves of the veil of innocence. This is exactly what happened. Now, this, of course, is going to explain why my husband, already as a young boy, was convinced that the intimate sphere should be a domain in which man and woman, united in marriage, express the desire of union. Therefore, it was for him something sacred. He knew that it was no plaything. Once again, grace. Don't forget, unfortunately, his father 
was not someone who had the highest respect for the Sixth Commandment. It was one of his lovable weaknesses. I say lovable weaknesses because he was a sort of Tom Jones. And uh, he saw it something very beautiful, enjoyable, but never understood the moral seriousness of it. His, his son opposed it. There's another thing which is very striking. He was convinced of the fact that personal things are infinitely more important than impersonal things. He already writes in his memoirs that he was a clear consciousness of what he calls the hierarchy of values, that things that matter most and that things that matter less and that things that do not matter. And what do not matter in the Hildebrand family was economics and finances. These are things that was, and I can say to the very end of his life, his innocence when it came to legal and financial things was pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> to such an extent that one day he said to me, which no one knows, you know, Hitler saved me from going to jail. It was a very surprising statement. He said, yes, you know, I had signed a document guaranteeing a man had borrowed money and he wanted to have some sort of a guarantee. And he came to my husband and he said, would you kindly sign it? And you know, he thought it was impolite to say no when he signed it. I mean, obviously the man, some sort of a crook, did not repay and therefore he was being sued by the woman and could have gone to jail because he was totally penalized. In this moment, Hitler invaded Austria and the whole thing disappeared. He was saved by Hitler. <laughs> But it was a bad habit that he kept to the very end of his life to sign contracts without reading them because he had the peculiar idea that it was impolite to mistrust his publisher. And he never read them. It was very unwise. Now, at any rate, this is a situation before he entered the church. He was absolutely convinced of the beauty of the intimate sphere reserved as an expression of love in marriage, as a grace. He was absolutely convinced of the divinity of Christ. He was absolutely convinced of the objectivity of values. And then at the age of 17, he enters the University of Munich. And he makes the acquaintance of Max Scheler, a tragic, undisciplined genius. That he was a genius is something that cannot be contested that he was totally undisciplined is just as true. He was a tragic figure, but my husband saw his nobility. And one very fine day, they started to talk until two and three in the morning. And uh, one very fine day, uh, Sheila said, you know, the Catholic Church has a truth. And the young man was absolutely amazed. Catholic Church has the truth. He has lived in Italy for years. He had gone to innumerable <coughs> churches because of the beauty the paintings or the sculpture, whatever, the statues. Catholic Church has the truth. He said, how so? He said, yes, she produces saints. This young man who was brilliant, had an extraordinary knowledge of, of painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, languages. Saint, what is a saint? Never heard the word. And then Sheila's sketch, the life of St. Francis of Assisi. And all of a sudden, a new world opened up. He read the life of St. Francis of Assisi. He was on his way. At any rate, he enters the University of Munich, and psycholo psychologism was, was rampant. In other words, everything that we know is a content of consciousness. And he was very unhappy about this, and all of a sudden there were rumors that there was someone in Göttingen who had written a book claiming that it was possible for the human mind to find objective knowledge. Even though it broke his heart to leave his beloved Munich, where his family lived, his sisters lived, he went there. North Deutschland, for a Süddeutsche, was not terribly appeasing. For the very plain reason, you know, it's very, very different, very more formal and so forth. But he went there and he made the acquaintance of Husserl. Now, he was a lovable man. He was definitely extremely talented. He was not a good professor. He mumbled and he went on. But he had an assistant, a young man of the name of Adolf Reinhardt, who was a superb teacher. 
and he was the first one who truly gave my husband a formal philosophical uh, formation for which he remained grateful for the rest of his life. Now, phenomenology is a very unfortunate word. My husband disliked it for the very plain reason that as soon as they say phenomenology, people turn pale because they immediately say, you know, that's Kant, you have the noumenon and the phenomenon, and we can only know the phenomenon. It's an unfortunate label. And I know that my friend Professor Zafet has tried his very best to correct it and try to show that actually phenomenology is something very different. It's not a school in this sense. But you can truly see that two things which are very prominent and which my husband taught me and repeated many times. First, knowledge is receptive, as opposed to Kantian philosophy, according to which the human mind interprets sense knowledge and forms it. Therefore, definitely, what we know is a human interpretation. It is not the objective knowledge. It's not the noumenon. No, it is very surprising that Kant knows that there is a noumenon, is everything that we produce is a phenomenon, but I mean, that's a problem that Kant has, and which is not my problem. At any rate, <laughs> the second thing, which is extremely important in phenomenology, is that in order for me to hear the message of the object, I have to need some sort of purification. This is an idea that you already find in Plato, but which is very much developed in phenomenology, all of us, all of us, have prejudices in some quarters. You know, we absorb it in our culture, in our education, wherever it is. And prejudices are an obstacle to objective knowledge. Therefore, what we have to do is to try to purify ourselves so that the object can truly com commit its message. As a result, my husband's formation was not Aristotelian, it was not Platonic, it was not Thomistic, it was not Kantian, it was not anything of the sort. It was just a sort of approach to knowledge that was capable of giving us authentic knowledge if you truly live up to it. He was not a scholar. You're very, very wrong if you approach him as a sort of scholar. He was not, he never claimed to be, and as far as I know, Cardinal and Newman never made the claim of being a scholar. He was not a theologian. Who was he? He was a man who had received an extraordinary talent to love and pursue truth, but whose mind has been partially blinded by original sin, as all of us are. What is the difference between Catholicism and Protestant and Calvinist? It's very simple. According to the Calvinists, we are hopelessly rotten. <coughs> or nature is ruined, or mind is ruined. In other words, we are just, it's only through faith that we can hope to be saved. According to the Catholic Church, our mind is wounded, but nevertheless still capable of finding objective truth. This is going to prove itself in the fact that in Plato and Aristotle, you find some admirable philosophical insights. I mean, I still believe that Platonic ethics is one of the masterpieces of pagan literature. It's absolutely unbelievable the way that he approaches the ethical sphere and relates the ethical sphere to God. Aristotle has his own greatness and is also his own weakness, the greatest of which was that he cuts off the relationship between God and man. This is something that I'm not going to go into. But my husband knew that he had a very powerful man. In the discussion with his father and his sister, he always had the last word. And then one very fine day, he discovers that the Catholic Church is the one true church. And he takes instructions and goes to a priest in Munich, who was a Franciscan, and the question of artificial birth control comes up. And he says, yeah, I can't see how artificial control can possibly be wrong. I mean, after all, you don't kill anything. You just prevent the semen from fecundating the egg. What is about that? And the priest was a real priest and simply said, either you accept the teaching of the church or I don't take you into the church. <laughs> as simple as that, this is what he should have done. This is what he did do. And my husband's answer was, credo ut intelligam. He made an act of faith in order to understand the famous words of St. Anselm, which I believe originate in, in St. Augustine. This act of humility 
paid immediate fruits. And the fruits were the following. He said to me, within weeks, I had such insights into the immorality of artificial contraception that he became a hero fighting against it. He was the first Catholic in 1930 to oppose the results of the Lambeth Conference in London. He was the first Catholic in 1968 when hundreds of Catholic theologians and philosophers protested against Humanivite in the New York Times, hundreds of names. And he was the one who wrote Humanivite, a sign of contradiction. Because he was so, no, it was a reward of the purification from this moment on. You can truly say that his one great concern was that his man should be purified by his faith. If you read his, his ethics, if you read his metaphysics or his epistemology, he never uses faith as an argument for opposition. But one thing is absolutely certain. The greatest of my husband was that he let his man be baptized. What does it mean? Purified of the weaknesses of original sin, the dark spots. And it is interesting to remark that the original sin has particularly affected our intellect, philosophical faculties, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics. These are the domains which are mostly affected, much less mathematics and science, much less, and for very obvious reason. Now, if you study the history of philosophy, you are going to see that from many points of view, the history of philosophy is very depressing. You have the extremely depressing. This is what I discovered when I was a student. You know, see philosophy, love of wisdom, and so on. You read Plato and Aristotle, they're two giants. The contributions are so remarkable that after centuries and centuries, you can see, we can still benefit from their contributions. But then came, that is, anti Luchem, and there were things they couldn't see, and it was not their fault. But then came Lux, revelation. And then you have St. Augustine, you are the great thinkers of the Middle Ages. You have St. Anselm, you have St. Bonaventure, you have St. Thomas, and it is the glory of Christian philosophy. And then came the tragic moment when I call post Lucem. And this starts in modern philosophy. I personally do not believe, as many people, that Descartes is the greatest culprit. You know, usually he's a black sheep, and Descartes, you see, Descartes people turn pale with horror. There are certain things in Descartes that are perfectly valid, and there are weaknesses. Now, I'll tell you something very, very sad, which is a fact. If someone says 10 truths and one error, the error is going to have an influence, the 10 truths are going to be forgotten. Very much as if a person is sick, he can make other people sick. If you are healthy, other people are not going to catch your health. <laughs> that is simply a rule. And so the weaknesses of Descartes are an enormous resonance. And then you have Spinoza, Locke, Bartley, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and it goes downhill, and now you have the disaster of modern philosophy. Now, why is modern philosophy a disaster? My husband is giving you a very simple answer. Before the revelation, people, of course, were not responsible for seeing certain things. After the revelation, it was accepted, and you have the glory of the Middle Ages, and afterwards, Please listen carefully. The supernatural was systematically rejected. They do not want it. They rejected it. It's eliminated completely. And the punishment is a terrible one. The punishment is always accompanies a crime. And as a result, human reason fell into rationalism. Rationalism, the pretentious, stupid, claim that the human mind can find answer to all questions. Ridiculous claim. And the very moment that you fall into this abyss, it's going to lead to idealism, to subjectivism, to empiricism, to the nonsense that have developed. To such an extent that I can only say, from the 17th century until the 20th century, philosophy has been a disaster. 
Of course, there is a great Cardinal Newman. Of course, you find magnificent insights in, in, in Kierkegaard. But all in all, it is a disaster. It is poison. And the tragedy is that sometimes people who is totally off can say something to the point. You know, when they're absent-minded, all of a sudden they say, can say something which is valid. You take an example, which is Nietzsche. He says terrible things, and all of a sudden he's absent-minded, or I don't know what happens to him, but he says something which is valid. This misleads people, and therefore you've got to realize what is typical of today is that a reason has the arrogance of believing that it can solve all questions. Now, it is interesting to remark that the very moment that the supernatural is systematically rejected, reason becomes sick. According to me, my interpretation of it is that human reason, as it is practiced today by atheists, has MS, meaning to say sick. How do you say MS? What? Yes, multiple sclerosis. And this is what is happening in the modern world. And this is why you have atheists and so on. This type of concentrated nonsense, which sells well because he has the appearance of truth. Science is not affected to the same extent. And this is why you see the decline of philosophy, the tragedy of philosophy in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, and simultaneously the development of science. And as a result, people believe science is going to give us all answers. Why is our mathematical man, why is our scientific man less affected than our metaphysical or ethical man? It's very simple, because science doesn't tell you how to live. Science is something magnificent. You discover the star, you discover the beauty of the human eye, you discover all sorts of magnificent things. And then you discover that it gives you power. And this power is technology. And this technology today has developed to such an extent that many people will live in the condition of the, we can solve all problems. We have become God, gives us another chance, and we're going to say, of course you can eliminate God. That was an idea that had some validity in the Middle Ages, but now it is not so. Now, what is my husband's position? He becomes a Roman Catholic. He is convinced two things happened. Number one, and this is something of extreme importance, as I said, his memoirs is also a confession. And he says naively, with the sort of sweet naivety that he had. Up to that time, I was the ultimate authority. My man was powerful. I could refuse my father, my mother, my sisters, my friends, and I knew the answers. And all of a sudden, by discovering that it was mind, he was blind to the question of artificial, he realizes that his man needed purification. The remarkable, the remarkable discovery that his man needed to be baptized, and he accepted to be baptized. The second thing is that he was absolutely convinced, because ever since he was a young boy, he was convinced the greatest thing in life was love. He had it when he was five, six, seven. And I mean, now, even though he had a magnificent youth, there was one dark story. The story was he was always falling in love, and his love was always rejected. That happened from the time he was nine, until much later. Why? Because he could only fall in love with girls that were seven, eight, nine years older than him. Because he found girls of his age, they didn't know Homer, they hadn't read Shakespeare, they knew nothing about, <laughs> and they found them boring. But I mean, girls that were 17 or 18 or 19 and so on, and so he fell in love. He had all sorts of Beatrice or all sorts of Dusselina around this way. And then he would bring them flowers, and he would bring them beautiful book bound in leather. He always came with and so on. And he sort of, of course they were pleased. You're 19 or so, and then this young boy of 11 comes with his best suit and a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> they loved it. But he lived in the illusion that possibly the love would be reciprocated. And uh, it wasn't, which is not very surprising. And one very fine day, he found out that the Beatrice, who seemed to be the fulfillment of all his desire, was engaged. And it was a terrible blow. And he ran to the grandmother of Guki, who was sitting there, sobbing, 
They said, Nini, Nini, she's engaged. I have no more chance. And she said to him, but you know, she was much too old for you, and you were not ready to get married anyway. What does he answer? Nini, I don't need you to know that. I'm not ready to be married, but I'm ready to love. <laughs> that was, I mean, from the very time it was on, he knew that was the most important and greatest thing. But the moment that he became a Catholic, he made an amazing discovery. He was this great lover, falling in love, seeing the beauty of Josilia, you know, praising her, singing her, and so And he discovered the tragedy of unbaptized love. If you read his, his book on love, you're going to see he realizes human love, which is not baptized, has an element of tragedy. Why? It longs for eternity, and we are finite. It longs for infinity, and we are terribly limited. It longs for perfe per perfection, and you realize more and more the imperfection. The tragic thing in human life, that sometimes we make the worst mistakes towards the people that we love, and we don't even realize it. And therefore, what happens the very moment that he entered the church, he realized love must be baptized. It is only when it is baptized that can reach its true, complete fulfillment. Now, as I told you, phenomenology did not dictate what he had to think. It was simply an approach to life. Let the object reveal itself and purify your mind, eliminate prejudices. This is why he approached Aristotle or Plato or whoever with a sort of new approach. I went to very good Catholic schools. One of the things that my father tried to, to do is to give us the very best possible Catholic education. And by the time I was a little child, of course, I knew about Aristotle, and I knew about the four causes, and I knew about the unmoved mover, and I knew about uh, um, the unmoved mover and uh, the four causes and the efficient cause and the rest of it. When he started to examine Aristotelian philosophy, he looked at it with fresh eyes. In other words, I was taught all this when I was in grammar school, and I sort of accepted it. For example, the idea that man is a rational animal. My husband did not reject it, but he thought it was extremely unsatisfactory, because the basic characteristic of man is that he's a person. And this is stated very clearly in the Bible, let us make man to our image and likeness, which means to say, I'm going to create a person. The angels are persons, human beings are persons, but the difficulty with man, which is a tremendous difficulty, is that we are so complex that this person is incarnated in a body. Now, between original sin, the relationship between body and soul was a very harmonious one. After original sin, the body resented the fact that he had to be personalized. And to mean personalized means every single physical activity has to have the seal of the spirit. And this was something that became very difficult after original sin because our animal body started revolting and making claims of its own. The problem is still more complicated because God created man male and female. English is a marvelous language. It's unbelievably rich. The poetry of English language is unique, but philosophically speaking, I don't think that it's a very good language. I think it has certain weaknesses. For example, in German, you have the word Leib, referring to a human body as opposed to Körper, refers to animal. Now, this is something which is very important because our body is not an animal body. It is a body of a person and therefore must live up to the demands of personhood. English is also unsatisfactory because it doesn't mean to my mind a satisfactory difference between shame and what the French call pudeur. There is no such word in English. You try desperately to correct it and you can't do it. And shame is usually associated with something that we are ashamed of whereas pudeur is a response for something which is noble, great, 
beautiful and calls for a certain awe. It calls for, suffer for, for covering because it is something that calls for awe, for respect. You turn to my husband's approach to Aristotle's ethics. Once again, when I was in high school, I knew perfectly well, you know, virtue is a good habit. Well, I mean, there's something that can be said in defense of it. There's only one difficulty, that the word habit is usually associated with things that we do by repetition, and then we are so used to it. I mean, for example, no, I left the United States a week ago. I'm not quite convinced that I locked my door. And suddenly you wake up during the night and say, for goodness sake, did I lock my door? <laughs> I have no recollection of doing it. I was tired, I was rushed. Most probably I did because I've done so 100,000 times. And then I do so by habit. You know, you do certain things and you don't know that you do it because you've done it so many times. For my husband, obviously, the very moment that you speak of virtue, you speak of a state of alertness. I mean, that if I'm generous, and I don't know that I'm generous, well, it's a little bit worrisome. I must be conscious of the fact that I'm responding to a call of a value, that this is what God expects me to do. And therefore, he offers a new definition of virtue. As a super, it's a new word that he introduces, super actual attitude towards the good. In other words, that my response to justice or my response to whatever it is, is something which is so imprinted in my soul that whether I actualize it or not is fully there. This is something which is going to apply to love. When I love a person, I don't love the person when, just when I see him. This is something which is going to insist upon. When I love, I love just as much when I fall asleep because super actually speaking, this love is living in me. This is confirmed by theologian. I read something very beautiful, that when the Holy Virgin was asleep, she was glorifying God more than the saint spending his whole life in front, his whole evening in front of the Blessed Sacrament, because her whole being was so turned toward God that even when she was asleep, she was glorifying God. Therefore, it's a sort of extremely important contribution that he makes. Now, as I told you, one of the things which is most deplorable in the history of philosophy, very depressing, is a lack of unity in a person's thought. Take, for example, someone like Aristotle, this gigantic man, this genius, was of the greatest genius of all times. And all of a sudden, it tells us that God has produced the world eternally, but it doesn't know that he has produced it because otherwise it would affect his perfection. In other words, it creates an abyss between God and man. Can you conceive that a man of such greatness makes such a blunder? You know, particularly after Plato, who sees that there is a relationship between God and man, that God exercises providence over men, that gods are pleased when we behave morally well. There's a sentence where he says, the gods are pleased when you honor your mother. This is something that Plato sees. Therefore, you all of a sudden, you have a shock and a disappointment. You take Plato probably one of the greatest geniuses of all times, who is going to create the highest realities, a world of ideas. In other words, it's not personal. He places ideas as being the supreme reality. Well, St. Augustine, being a Christian, immediately realizes this is a tragic defect, and as a result, places the world of ideas in God, and God the person, the infinitely personal God, is the fullness of perfection. Throughout the history of philosophy, you're going to find out that there can be a lack of unity between what a person writes at one point and what he points at another point. It can be simply because he's written a great deal, and after 30 years he's forgotten what he wrote 30 years before. This is why it is so difficult to interpret philosophers. They say one thing here and they say another thing there, and how do you bring it together? Uh, the very, very cynical Jonathan Swift wrote in Gulliver's Travel that in the third book, 
that uh, Gulliver comes to the country of the mathematicians. And these men are geniuses, amazing geniuses, that one particular point, by means of geometrical formulas, they can call people back to life. And of course, Gulliver is tremendously impressed, and they come to him and say, I mean, who is the person that you would like to call back to? He says, Aristotle. And they start scribbling and scribbling. All of a sudden, a very impressive man with a long gown comes into the room. And they say, that's Aristotle. <laughs> and he's followed by a huge crowd. And Gulliver says, who are they? And the mathematician says, well, they're his commentators. But he says, but he knew none of them. <laughs> Why? Because it's very, very difficult to interpret someone because there's not always harmony between all his arguments. I mean, who is the real interpreter of Aristotle? Is it Avicenna? Is it Averroes? Is it Thomas Aquinas? Is it Zag of Braben? And today they're still fighting. You know, we have to go to the other side and then we'll find out and then it lose any interest. Because in this very moment, I don't care. <laughs> no, I just want to show to you that it is absolutely surprising the lack of unity, the lack that you find in philosophers, you find very, very few would have truly harmonized. And it seems to me, as far as I can tell, that one of the things that impressed me so much about my husband, if you turn to his metaphysics, his, epist his epistemology, the six books of his ethics, three of which are not translated as yet into English, to my great grief and sorrow, you turn to his aesthetics, you turn to his uh, political philosophy, his social philosophy, there is a perfect line of continuity. You can predict, so to speak, what he's going to do. Not that let us apply this to his life. He becomes a Catholic, and you understand this is the truth, not a truth, because Christ is the only person, neither Mohammed, nor Moses, nor anybody ever dare say, I am the truth. Now, according to him, a truth is available to man. He can't communicate or see a truth. But if you truly understand the meaning of truth, it leads you to the truth, and then you fall on your knees and you adore. This is what I've seen in the magnificent conversions that I experienced in Hunter again and again. You discover that truth is subjective, it leads you to Christ, and you fall on your knees. Now, he converts. He becomes professor at the University of Munich. And he certainly enters into the world in which he discover to be her doctor is the supreme greatness. And all the rest is quite of secondary. Now, he was a sweet revolutionary in the sense that he detested certain things and he was going to oppose it. And so he made a point of always giving preference to his students when they went through a door. You know, in Europe, it's much more formal and you let the more. And one of his colleagues came along and said, what are you doing? You let your students get ahead of you. And he said, would well, they preach? Yes, but they have no doctorate. <laughs> That's so typical. I mean, just imagine to consider that to have a PhD is more important than to be a priest. No, in other words, mistake number one, that he was proclaiming that he did not consider that a PhD was the highest dignity that could be given to a human being. And then comes German nationalism. You know, the defeat in 1918 was a terrible thing for the German pride. Deutschland über alles. And there was some sort of reaction of such violence, which led to Hitler, because Hitler sort of promised, I'll go back to the greatness of the German people. Now, for my husband, Deutschland, alles didn't make any sense at all. He was a patriot. He loved Germany. I mean, after all, Germany is a country that has given her the most beautiful and sublime music. And music was absolutely crucial in his life from the time he was a child. He loved it. But nationalism, and simply say, Deutschland über alles, my country, is something that he could not accept as a practicing Roman Catholic. And he made this perfectly clear, made himself as unpopular with his colleagues as he can. One of his friends said to him, you know, you're trying everything possible to ruin your career. And he succeeded, because his career was a disaster. And then Hitler comes to power. He goes home and he says to his wife, we are leaving the country. 
I cannot stay for 24 hours in a country headed by a criminal, packs one suitcase and leaves for Florence, where his sisters was living. And there's a very point, it was for him very, very hard. He loved Munich. His sisters lived his music, his friends in music. He loved his work at the university, his contact with the students. And he says something which is very touching. He lived in this beautiful house built by his father, and he went from room to room to say goodbye. He knew he was leaving. He came to Florence, lost everything, couldn't take any money, and he stayed at the house of his sister. It was a huge convent, plenty of room for them, and he stayed there until he found out that Dolphus was the only politician in Europa who was clear-headed. He went to, you know, to Vienna and offered his services, and Dolphus, who was a profound Catholic, a convinced Catholic, convinced that Hitler was an antichrist, founded, helped him to found and finance a magazine to oppose Nazism and communism, because many people became Nazis because they hated communism, and they became communists because they hated Nazis. And he said, no, they are twin brothers in, in error. A few months later, Dolphus was assassinated. And in this very moment, you had another chancellor, who was a good man, wanted peaceful coexistence peaceful coexistence between Germany and Austria, made one compromise after the other, did not support the magazine. And as a result, my husband had to do fundraising for which he was the least gifted person in the world. <laughs> he suffered day after day after day. He couldn't pay his bills and difficulties of all sorts. Dolphus had promised a professorship at the university. He had written many important books. The protest was so violent that when he was supposed to give his first lecture, Dolphus uh, Schustig immediately, it was wiser to give him a professor of assistant professor, not professor. Nevertheless, there was a manifestation. The students came with pick and sticks. The grandfather of John Henry was among them. And then afterwards he converted. He came to my husband and knelt in front of me and begged him for apology. He had to enter the audience room protected by 48 policemen armed to the teeth. Otherwise, he could not have given the lecture. Well, he continued to do so. The faculty was Nazi. When they entered the faculty room, they turned their back, refused to give it a hand. He was treated abominably, and as a result, his life was extremely difficult, but he said, it is a cross I have to carry, and he fought. Hitler invaded Austria because there was going to be a referendum, and it might be that the anti-Nazi would have won, and so Hitler invaded. He left his apartment at 9 o'clock in the evening, took the last train to Czechoslovakia. Four hours later, four Gestapo came to arrest him, because his name was the first one on the name of the government to be arrested. He had a Swiss passport, because thank God his grandfather was a revolutionary, he left Germany, was condemned to death, escaped in Switzerland and became famous because he was a professor of economics, became professor in Bern and then in Zurich. And then he inherited the Swiss citizenship, which like baptism cannot be lost. And, <laughs> and as a result, I happened to be a Swiss citizen. They call me Papier Schweizerin, but I mean I am entitled to the Swiss citizenship because my husband was a... The Germans did not know that he was using his Swiss passport. He passed the border, and five hours later on, there was a warrant of arrest of all the borders with his photograph and the one of his wife. He had escaped to Czechoslovakia. From there, he went to Hungary. From there, to Yugoslavia. Now, then Italy and landed in Switzerland. Not one penny. He lived from the charity of Swiss Catholics. And one day I recall I said to him, wasn't it hard for you, after the beautiful life that you have lived in Florence and in Munich, he said, to be totally penniless. And he looked at me in amazement, he says, for never in the world would I have missed the sweetness of Catholic charity. You know, Catholic charity forces you to keep saying thank you. And he said many times, the key to happiness is gratitude. And then he was called as professor at the University of Toulouse, and then the German invaded. And once again, he knew that he was on the list of people to be persecuted. 
As a result, what does he do? He has to go into hiding and get a false name. And he was called Monsieur Richard, which in French means Mary Rich. <laughs> what did he have? A single penny. He managed to escape, went to Portugal, to, uh, to uh, Spain, Portugal, Brazil, finally came to the United States. His book, In Defense of Purity, had been very popular, and he was immediately appointed professor at Fordham University. But to his horror, he found out that he had fought racism in Europe. He was fighting anti-Semitism. He called anti-Semitism a scandal, because, I mean, after all, Christ was a Jew. The Holy Virgin was a Jew. And as a result, he fought against it, and he was very unpopular for this reason. He comes to the United States and finds out that the Archbishop of New Orleans, Rubber, had invited a black priest to say mass. And when people saw it, they left the church. He was so horrified that he said, I just left Europe and I fought anti-racism, and now I find the same thing. He got in touch with the Archbishop, and they became friends. And the first thing that he did was to go to Harlem, to the Baroness de Luke, and to give yeah, penniless to black people and to trade them into the church. He came Professor Hume. But the difficulties were not over. At Fordham, the whole formulation, the whole training was purely Thomistic. And he was not officially a Thomist, and so when he applied for promotion, he was turned on. I mean, you know, phenomenologist, I mean, what that, the fact that he had so many published so many books, therefore he wasn't, he was promoted, he was not promoted, it was another failure. In the meantime, the war had started. And of course, he was against defeating Nazism from ABC. But the moment that he saw that Churchill and, and Roosevelt were giving half of Europe to Stalin, he raised his hand and started to say, no, the danger of communism is just as great, and he started opposing it. Once again, people rejected him because they said, you know, this gallant Russian that were working with us against the Nazis and the dirty Nazis, and once again, he gave a talk in the Middle Ages, and he's in, in, in the Midwest, and one of the nuns says, how can you compare these gallant Russians to the Nazis? They were just as bad. You know, Stalin was worse than Hitler because he was more efficient. Hitler gave maybe 15 million, but Stalin beat it up game. It must be 60 or 70 million that he killed. And he read, once again, he was not popular. Now came Vatican II. Vatican II was acclaimed by most Catholics very rightly as a moment of renewal. You know, a council was something very great, and like everybody else, he was setting right gate in purifying the church, who always needs purification. He knew the history of the church by heart. He knew that they were very good very tragic things in the history of the church, bad popes, bad bishops, betrayal, traitors, and the rest of it. But simultaneously, he knew that the Holy Catholic Church is a bride of Christ, and she is holy, and he loved her. And all of a sudden, he started having worries. Articles were published that were definitely not in agreement with the teaching of the church. He's taking a sabbatical in Florence, and he decided to have a private audience with Paul VI. And uh, we got one, but the audience lasted five minutes. He received a standing, which is very extraordinary. In the first day, my husband started shooting from the hip. In perfect Italian, the Pope was surprised, and he said, you realize the church coming to a crisis as serious as the Protestant Reformation, if not worse. And people are getting increasingly confused and beg your holiness to speak clearly and to teach clearly what is the teaching of the church. And the Pope was almost scared, and he says, lo scriva, lo scriva, write it down, write it down. And my husband insisted. He pushed him against the wall, practically, <laughs> and kept repeating. And the Pope turned to me and said, please pray for me, an expression of, all right. Went back to Florence. For five weeks, he wrote a long article, sort of explaining, this has to be changed, and this has to be changed because of the sinfulness of men. But what is not to be changed is one iota of the church doctrine in moral, doctrine and moral. We went to Germany when we had to retreat with a group of Benedictine uh, persons and read the document. 
and people thought it was very impressive, and I translated it into French because Paul VI didn't know German, and it was officially presented to him. And uh, then what happened was we went back to the United States. I took back my job at Hunter in silence, and for four, four months silence, and then I pick up the mail in this Città del Vaticano, and I bring the book, letter to my husband, and it was not written by Paul VI, but the secretary thanking him for his document, read very carefully. But basically, it was saying very little. Then, the uncle of Guki, who is here, became German ambassador of the Holy See. And he brought his credential to the Pope in April 66. And what he did do was to to say, I bring you the respectful regards of my uncle Dietrich von Hildebrand. Now, because my, my husband only had sisters, all his uh, sisters married different names, and they didn't know there was a connection. And then the Pope said, well, you know, I received his document. It was, we read it very carefully, it was very impressive, but you know, era un po' duro, it was a bizarre, because he was sort of begging the Pope to speak, speak clearly, again, all the errors that we manifest. From this moment on, he stopped writing Das Wesen der Liebe that he had been working on, and for four or five years, he dedicated his life to fighting the errors that had developed after Vatican II, the Trojan horse in the city of God, the devastated vineyard, celibacy, uh, the humanity, innumerable articles, and so on. And once again, he made himself very unpopular because everybody was saying it a uh, renewal, and so on. Once again, he was considered to be Sina, and I recall Gregory Baum, who came to me. After all, he left the church, he says, what is the matter with your husband? All of a sudden, he seemed to become a reactionary. And I said, you misunderstood him from the very beginning. You know, his guideline is truth, and not the spirit of the time. At any rate, then he went back to the Wesen der Liebe, and he completed it, and then gave talks in California, and uh, they announced that uh, uh, Bertrand Russell had died, and praised him to the skies, one of the greatest thinkers of the time, and he wrote Principia Mathematica in so many months. And my husband went back to New Rochelle and said to me, you know, I feel like writing aesthetics. I think it is. He wrote 900 pages in 10 months. And afterwards, he still wrote a large book on ethics, which is the last volume, and then realizing that he was, he said to me, I've tried for months to stay with you. I'm losing the battle. And then he wrote a meditation on death. And one little booklet on gratitude saying to me, gratitude is the key to happiness. A few days before his death, he said to me, you know, I've tried my whole life long to live out according to the hierarchy of values. And when he was actually dying, he started to speak Italian. And he said, Io ero un leone, I was a lion. Adesso sono uno scriccioli, you know. I'm a helpless little thing. But sai, mia anima ancora un leone. My soul is still a lion. This is why I call my biography of my husband the soul of a lion. And then he said, I confide my literary bequest to you. But do me one favor. If you find one sentence which is not in perfect agreement with the teaching of the church, burn it. That was Dietrich von Hildebrandt. Mm -hmm.